new from the Leader One Podcast Network, Straight from the Can, a guide to prison culture. How does the portrayal of prison in film and television stack up against its real-life equivalent? How do you survive in prison with your sanity intact? Join me, Morgan Rector, and my ex-con co-hosts, Raymond Hazen Jr. and Jason McMurray as we delve into the truth of incarceration. Available on all podcast platforms. The following clip was produced by Med Circle. What is the difference between a sociopath, a psychopath, and a narcissist? Here to answer this intense question is Dr. Romani. Help us out here. Well, it's, you know, again, there's a lot of overlap, but the fact is a lot of people are using these terms interchangeably. Mm. They and should they be? Sociopath, they psych- no, they no. shouldn't, they're okay. different things, okay? One rule of thumb to remember right off the bat, Every psychopath is narcissistic, but not every narcissist is psychopathic. Make sense? There's there's your key difference. A narcissist is somebody who lacks empathy, is grandiose, is entitled, is constantly seeking validation, is arrogant. Um, It's a disorder of self-esteem and they have trouble regulating their self-esteem. But when a narcissist does a bad thing, they feel a fair amount of guilt and shame. More shame than guilt, frankly, because they're concerned about how other people view them. Shame is a public emotion. So they don't like being viewed negatively in the public eye or by other people, that's where the shame comes from. But they'll feel a little bad. Like if they cheat on their wife, I probably shouldn't have done that. Psychopaths a different animal. They're all of those things except no guilt, no shame. Wow. They don't feel remorse when they do something bad. Wow. So they're, they're great, um, Serial killers, oh. hired assassins, um, people who are going to go in and literally sort of gut a business. These are your guys. They're like, I don't, I don't care who gets hurt. They'd say that and they'd mean it. Okay, where a narcissist is like, I hope no one gets hurt. Okay. The difference between the psychopath and the sociopath is the one where most people get confused because the sociopath is a lot like the psychopath. They do bad things and they don't care. Okay. Here's the key difference a psychopath is born and a sociopath is made. Mm. Okay, that's the key. So a psychopath, in fact, we know in the research on psychopathy, which has also been called antisocial personality disorder in our diagnostic manual, these are people who are actually believed to have slightly different autonomic nervous systems. Our autonomic nervous system is actually that part that holds our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight and flight system. So when our autonomic nervous system for a normal person gets charged up, which it would if we broke a rule if we did something embarrassing or rude, if we ran through a red light, our heart starts racing. Mm -hmm. We sweat, our our pupils get wide, we look around because we're afraid of the consequence. A psychopath doesn't have that same kind of arousal. That's why they're able to lie on lie detector tests. That's how they get away with it. They don't have that same kind of arousal. So where you or I may go on a roller coaster, feel that sense of excitement, we need to get that arousal in a good way. We don't like feeling it when we do something wrong. They don't feel it. So do they get stressed? No, not in the same way. So if they're driving, Mm -hmm. because if I'm driving Mm -hmm. and I see police sirens coming behind me, I mean, it is a full on, oh oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm going to get pulled over. (laughs) But a psychopath would see that and go, oh, I'm going to get pulled over. Cool as could be. They could have a dead body in the trunk and they wouldn't, they wouldn't change. And so they pull over, they get the ticket and they don't care. No, they don't care. And they pay the ticket? If and maybe not, they'll even probably get an attorney to get them off or say, yeah, you know, my understanding of your state laws is you can't really be doing this and they'll be cool as can be. And this is this is a, a difference in their 
They're actually their how makeup. the nervous systems are wired and their brains are. There's actually been interesting research done with PET scans where you can see brain function and what not just shown, to clarification, not PET like dogs and cats, PET, PET yeah, scans. Yes. Positron emission tomography scans yes. of the brain which show brain functioning, if you will, and what they see is that the the section of the brain that serves empathy, that doesn't naturally light up in them. And you can actually teach them to be empathic for a minute, but it doesn't last. A lot of psychopaths who commit violent crimes end up in jail, and the ones who commit more like white collar crimes, I guess they end up as multi-billionaires <laughs> because they're willing to do really, really rough stuff in their business and get through a, like a cartel leader or something like that call for the killings of other people. Now, their interesting um, counterpart are the sociopaths. Psychopaths born, they tend to, their belief is that they may very well have, this might be genetic. In fact, psychopaths often have fathers who have lots of antisocial tendencies. Now, how much of it is learned, how much of it is genetic, it's a little bit harder to suss out, but we do see that there is that difference in your true psychopath. They also tend to be, have really glib, shallow charm. They tend to be really intelligent. That's why they get away with stuff. If they were so they've, really they've learned mess. behavior to yeah. assimilate into society. Oh yeah. But there is, it's all a facade. It's all a facade, they're so charming. So if they're born this way, would a three-year-old then not get stressed out if it got no. scared? So uh, that's incredible. So what we see when we diagnose antisocial personality disorder, which is sort of our diagnostic equivalent of being a psychopath, in order to get that diagnosis, you have to have shown a pattern prior to the age of 15 of things like truancy, violence towards other kids, stealing, skipping school. And not felt bad animals, about it. Setting fires, they just do it, they don't care. And that before the age of 15, so it's a long standing pattern. That's what makes us call them a psychopath or having antisocial personality. Now, this is different than sociopathy. Yes, okay. Sociopathy, they look a lot like the psychopaths. The difference is they were made. So this, some examples here. The kid who grows up in a really, 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 really rough neighborhood and learns criminality to get by or learns to be a bully or like, you know, gets involved with sort of like the wrong kids and uses a lot of muscle because that's survivalism. But they, they it's not necessarily always comfortable for them. They just learn it. It's the person who grows up with a father who teaches them the business and teaches them how to break the rules. Um, they, he may But not, they, like, they don't. They would, would they feel, would they start sweating and have their heart race if they, might, they got pulled over? They might, they may, may not feel so good about it. They'll be a little bit more uncomfortable with it, but in time they learn it. And that, that what it's almost like they, they get trained in not being as aroused by it. Listen, if you broke enough rules, if you lived under certain conditions of lawlessness long enough, you'd adjust to that new world order, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. That's what the sociopath does. Mm -hmm. And so they're the person, who someone who said he was actually a great kid until he got to high school. And then it seems like he got in with the wrong kids. That feels more like the sociopath. Wow. Okay, that's almost like a training that might happen from at the, in, within the family, within their community, within even the job they get, some cases even within some form of military training. Have you had sociopaths and psychopaths as clients? Mm, not really, no. no. They don't come to, tend to come in for therapy. They, they don't see any benefit to it. The only time you would tend to see psychopaths or sociopaths come into therapy with any consistency is if they were court ordered. So I thought you, you were going to say um, couples therapy. No, God, no. No, no, they, it's because they're court ordered. So the judge will make that a condition of release kind of thing. Or they're within prisons and jails and getting some treatment in there. Th this is so incredibly fascinating to me. If a psychopath goes to jail, he isn't upset about going to jail? Um, it's, in some ways, it becomes a cost of doing business. You know, but it's also, they, no, they're not happy about it. There was, psychopaths and to some degree sociopaths don't think about consequences. That's why they pull really penny ante silly crimes like holding up a liquor store. Basically, I need 150 bucks, here's a liquor store, it's open, let's go get the money kind of thing. So it's like they act first and think later, so they often don't plan in terms of consequences. That's why they have a tendency to lie, cheat, steal, and they tend to have very inconsistent work histories because they, um, they're they not able to hold a job. They're yeah, like aliases. Um, it's definitely like it's more of a griftery kind of a space. So we've talked in previous videos about how to cope mm -hmm. while dating a narcissist. Yeah. 
if you find yourself dating a sociopath or a psychopath, is there any coping or you just got to get out? You're in trouble. You're in that, trouble. It could be, actually be a very dangerous It sounds like it. Yeah. In fact, you know, we, and, and to, even with the narcissistic piece, um, I do, uh, I've done research and work in the area of domestic violence or what's also called intimate partner violence. Most people who perpetrate domestic violence are either narcissistic or psychopathic. And so, so there's a danger there. In other words, they will dispose of you if you get in their way. I want to share a story with mm -hmm. you to get your feedback. Mm -hmm. This was told to me by a friend mm -hmm. and she said in college, she dated a guy for a year, mm -hmm. but the guy started to get um, just a little weird and mm -hmm. they broke up. Uh, for the next year, he courted her mm -hmm. and did everything she wished mm -hmm. he had done the first year. Mm -hmm. Showed up on time, brought her gifts, blah, blah, blah. They started dating again. He was perfect for a year. Mm -hmm. He, they went to Thanksgiving at her family's house. He was perfect to her parents, just became the perfect mm -hmm. man for her because right. he knew what she wanted. And after a year on the one year anniversary, he broke up with her and said, I've been playing you this whole time because I wanted to crush your heart. Yep. I, I am not actually mm -hmm. behaving this way, mm -hmm. or uh, this isn't real. Yep. I've been faking it for a year just so I can crush you. Yep. Would that be a That's psych more psychopathic? Psychopath. That's more psychopathic. You know, or sociopathic is more likely. You know, um, but if they have no empathy, then why would they want to hurt somebody? Um, because because empathy. Empathy is not, empathy is a positive emotion, okay? Wanting to hurt someone is a very antagonistic emotion. Wanting to hurt someone at some level might even give them a little pleasure. Power, for sure. It's it's interesting to me that someone cannot be empathetic but then want to hurt somebody because to me, you would mm -hmm. have to have the empathy in order to even know what no. it's like to hurt somebody. There's a difference between empathy and understanding. Mm. You can understand what, because oh. it's, it's like, that's why psychopaths that make sense. great salesmen. Because they understand a person, they can read a person and immediately say, I got his vulnerability. I'm going to make him buy a car. God. Psychopaths are great salesmen. Some salesmen for cars, timeshares, all the all that stuff where they're upselling and almost taking advantage of someone sometimes, making them take on more money and cost of something than they really should. But no, 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 it's that he was able to be superficially charming. Psychopaths and sociopaths and narcissists make great chameleons. They're <sighs> definitely able to change the situation to get what they want. And psychopaths in particular and sociopaths are they they view the world as an instrument to fulfill their desires. Mm. That's really what they're about, which is what it's awful because they're going to often discard a partner when they don't have much use for them or expect them to be, have a very specific role. So they may have married her and she may have had their kids. Now she's going to have to put up with their affairs because they want something else. And too bad if you don't like it, this is the new world order and I will destroy you in court. It's that kind of thing. That is insane. Yeah, it's chilling. Today we will be covering a lot of ground. So let me dive in hard and heavy. I want to warn listeners that some of the words used to name a diagnosis might seem disrespectful and derogatory, but we are merely using and quoting the words we have discovered in our research. It by no means reflects our feelings or attitudes towards or about the patients and their diagnoses. John Straffen Every Monday morning at 10 a.m., the 13 sirens located in and around the towns and villages surrounding Broadmoor would be tested to confirm they are still in good working order. Residents have become accustomed to the blaring of the obnoxious sound, but I am certain that they would by far prefer the invasive sound to the sudden surprise that a patient, most likely dangerous and deranged, had escaped without warning and was now unknowingly wandering the streets and pathways of the scenic landscape. The sirens would only be implemented during 1952 and only after the escape of a patient led within hours to the death of a five-year-old little girl. The information about John Thomas Straffen is about as scant as it is dismal. Apart from the fact that until Ian Brady from our Couples Who Kill episode beat him as the man who lived the longest during his life sentence and the fact that his escape from Broadmoor would be the reason why, for miles surrounding the institution, 
No one could take a nap on a Monday morning as staff test the air raid sounding sirens across the meadows. John never amounted to much else. He was born on the 27th of February, 1930, right in the middle of the Depression and smack bang between two world wars to an already dirt poor family. He was one of three children, and it's speculated that both his sister, who would die young, and his mother both suffered from low intelligence. His mother was a homemaker, and nothing else about her is available anywhere. His father was a soldier, and the family would frequently be on the move, even moving to India for six years, when John was two years old. It would be here that he contracted encephalitis, which translates to inflammation of the brain due to infection or an allergic reaction. This unfortunate illness, as well as a head injury he would later have, would both be presented as reasons for his deviant behavior as he grew older. His family would eventually settle in Bath, Somerset, after his father decided to leave the army. Back in England, John struggled in school. In 1938, he began his career as a thief, and by 1939, at the tender age of nine, he had already appeared before the juvenile court judge for stealing a little girl's purse. Officials recognized that he had no understanding of the difference between right and wrong, nor does he know what probation even means. Realizing that his mother would not be able to assist her son, the probation officer took it upon himself to take John to a psychiatrist for an evaluation. He would be deemed mentally defective and would attend a school for mentally defective children until the age of 16. With each assessment of his cognitive intelligence, he would always be described as at least five years behind children his own age. By the time he was 17, he would be deemed mentally retarded with the intellectual capacity of a 10-year-old child. He also had anger issues, was described as moody and sullen, and spent most of his time by himself. He also bore an undeniable hatred for authority, especially the police. He returned to Bath in 1946 and began working as a machinist in a clothing factory. He would continue being a loner, and would continue to commit petty crimes, hiding the items he stole from unoccupied homes. On the 23rd of July, 1947, a 13-year-old girl reported that John had covered her mouth from behind and asked, What would you do if I killed you? I've done it before, you know. Five days later, he killed five of the chickens owned by the family of another girl with whom he had an argument. He would be arrested for the latter crime, but happily and without provocation, admitted to a whole lot of other crimes he committed. Under the Mental Health Act, he was sent to Hotham Colony, an open institution where people with mental illness who have criminally offended could be hopefully rehabilitated to be released back into society. He originally did well, but after he stole a bag of walnuts, went home without leave, and then resisted being taken back, all the work he had done in his rehabilitation was pointless. During further examination, it was found that John had suffered severe damage to his cerebral cortex, most likely as a result of the illness he contracted in India. In 1951, He was, however, reassessed and finally released into the care of his mother. He continued to resent the police, and when, on the morning of his assessment, a young girl by the name of Christine Butcher was murdered, and John realized how the murder of a little girl would ensure the maximum trouble to the police, a light bulb went on in his mind. This is not the correlation any healthy mind would make. But John was, by no means, a man with a good grasp on logic. On the 15th of July, 1951, John decided to go to the cinema. 
On his way, he encountered a little girl by the name of Brenda Goddard, who was picking wildflowers on the side of the road. He told her he knew of a better place to pick flowers and picked the little girl up and over the fence. According to his statement to police later, she hit her head on a stone and he strangled her to death. After the murder, he continued to the movies where he watched the blockbuster of the time, Shockproof, and returned home without missing a beat. John would be interviewed on the 3rd of August, and he knew he was under the police's scrutiny, but ultimately, he enjoyed being nothing but an annoyance to the authorities. On the 8th of August, John again went to the cinema, where he met 9-year-old Cicely Batstone. They went together to another cinema to watch a movie, after which they took a ride on a bus to a meadow he was familiar with. There he strangled the little girl to death. John made no effort to disguise his identity, and a courting couple, the bus driver and a policeman's wife, would later all identify him as the man that was last seen with the little girl. John was arrested on the following morning and once again, without provocation, admitted that he killed Brenda Goddard. During his trial, it was established that, because of his diminished intellectual capacity, it was doubtful that John would understand his plea or the consequences, and thus he was sent to Broadmoor Hospital indefinitely. His short stay was uneventful, and we can safely assume he behaved himself reasonably well because he was allowed to do work in and around the institution. On the 29th of April, 1952, merely six months after he arrived at Broadmoor, John scaled the 10-foot wall while on work detail and wearing civilian clothing underneath his uniform, escaped the hospital. He first encountered an elderly lady working in her garden, and he proceeded to ask her for a glass of water. She would later state that he seemed like just another ordinary young man, but within five hours, he would murder five-year-old Linda Boyer after noticing the little girl riding on her bicycle. He would stand trial for the murder and a tug-of-war between his culpability and his mental capacity to understand what he had done would be the main theme of the proceedings. The jury would, however, return within an hour and declare that John Straffen was sane and guilty of the murder. He was handed down a death sentence, which was later commuted to life without the possibility of parole. He would try for many years to be released on several grounds of appeal, but would eventually pass away after spending 55 years in prison in the Franklin Correctional Institution on the 19th of November, 2007. His escape from Broadmoor did, however, highlight the fact that the existing sirens were insufficient and that the little more than three-mile reach is not enough to warn residents of the area of an escape. By 1960, 13 sirens would be activated if a patient escaped, giving villagers and residents of the surrounding areas enough warning to stay inside and not leave their children unsupervised. Hannibal the Cannibal To someone like me who is a claustrophobic, the mere thought of getting into an elevator, watching the doors close, and knowing for the next couple of seconds or minutes I am trapped in an enclosed space is an absolute living nightmare. The thought of spending the rest of my life in a prison cell, let alone a perspex box, would be a fate worse than death. This would be the destiny of Robert Maudsley, who would be known by the press as the real-life Hannibal the Cannibal, and to inmates as the Brain Eater, or Spoons. It would be during his stay at Broadmoor that Robert would gain his infamy, when he and another prisoner kidnapped another patient, dragged him into a cell, and locked themselves inside, as well as barricading the door. As guards and nurses pled for hours with the man's captures, 
Robert and his accomplice would beat and torture their victim for hours. And finally, once the battered and bloody victim of Robert's rage finally had succumbed to his injuries, they lifted the limp, unrecognizable dead man's body up to the window at the door of the room. Sticking out from the top of the man's head, there was a spoon lodged in his skull that clearly had been cracked like an egg. But despite some serious rumors, it was never confirmed that Robert ever took a bite of brain matter. Why am I disappointed? This episode also would result in him being referred to as the most violent prisoner in Britain. As with most of the subjects of our episodes, Robert was born on the 26th of June, 1955, in Liverpool to not ideal circumstances. When he was six years old, social services decided that he, as well as all his siblings, should be removed from the care of his parents due to neglect. The 13 siblings were split up, and Robert would be sent to Nazareth House with three of his brothers. Here, the highly intelligent young man would have an excellent relationship with the nuns who looked after him. But after eight years of stability, disaster would strike again. His parents, who were already accused of being passively neglectful, made a bid to get their children back, and they won. What was before just neglect soon turned into torture. The house became a dwelling of unbridled violence, with Robert's father beating his children constantly. But having a special affinity to hurt Robert, especially when he stood up for his siblings. At one point, Robert was locked up in a room for six months, living on scraps of food and glasses of water. Apart from feeding time, the only other time the door would open would be when his father entered, usually with a weapon like a poker, to beat the teenager. For some strange reason, his parents decided to tell his siblings he was dead, and instead took him back to the social services, where he would spend time in several foster homes. It would be during this time of instability that Robert would not only be beaten, but repeatedly sexually abused. He would eventually leave Liverpool as a teenager and get rejected by the Beatles, no, just kidding, and opted to see if, if the streets of London would be kinder. But they weren't. To survive, he sold his sexual services, and soon became a regular drug user. He also became suicidal, and often stayed for short periods of time in the psychiatric wards of hospitals that admitted him for failed attempts to take his life. In 1973, Robert met John Farrell. The two got along, but Robert's attitude would do a 180-degree turn when John clearly not aware that Robert was sensitive to the subject, showed photographs of children he had abused in an almost prideful manner. This enraged Robert immensely, since he resonated with children in the photographs who had been sexually abused. Thus, he lured John into a public bathroom stall, where he strangled him with a necktie. Reckoning he had done the world a favor, he made no attempt to hide his crime, and soon he was arrested. In his mind, he did the righteous thing on behalf of everyone who had ever been abused as a child. He was handed down an undetermined sentence and eventually sent to Broadmoor, where he would become even more notorious. At the age of 21, Robert was well aware that within Broadmoor's walls, Many other sex offenders would be living and breathing next to him, and he waited a full three years until 1977 when he and an accomplice decided to attack David Francis, a convicted sex offender, hold him hostage, and torture him to death. The attack would last for nine hours, and apart from the spoon sticking out of his skull, Bits of David's brain would also be missing, which led to the legend that Robert had used the spoon to eat David's brain. The floor, walls, and roof were painted red with the departed patient's blood. To authorities, the crime showed premeditation, and Robert was transferred to Wakefield Prison, 
which at the time was also known as Monster Mansion. Once again, he was surrounded by men he deemed not worthy of life, and that should be removed from the planet. A year after his arrival and the incident with David Francis, he decided to play the role of avenging Angel again. By now, he knew most of the people in prison, which enabled him to make a list of seven men he wanted to murder, all in a record-breaking one day. His first victim in prison was a man by the name of Stanley Durwood, who had been convicted of killing his wife. As soon as the man stepped into his cell, he stabbed him to death with a knife he had fashioned from other utensils. Although Durwood was not a child molester, in Robert's mind, he did the right thing. He pushed his victim's body under his bunk and casually called out to other names on his list, inviting them in for a chat. No one accepted, so instead, Robert picked up his knife and with murder in his eyes, started to walk along the landing until he reached the cell of William Roberts, who happened to have made the vigilante's kill list. Within minutes, Robert was dead after Robert bashed his head into a wall and then hacked at his head with his weapon. He then casually strolled out of the cell, proclaiming that there will be two less for roll call that evening. Prison officials realized quickly that this prisoner on a rampage was a clear and present danger to his fellow inmates. He was placed in solitary confinement, where he will remain till the day he dies. Robert Maudsley was relatively unknown until the BBC decided to do a documentary about men in solitary confinement. Afterwards, prison officials decided that they had to make an example out of Robert, and a cell unlike any other was designed especially for the most dangerous prisoner in Wakefield. Robert's new cell would be in the basement and would be a reinforced, bulletproof, plexiglass cage through which he would be under surveillance 24 hours a day. A lot like the containment cell that was used to house Magneto in the the second X-Men movie. This transparent cage is in a concrete cell that has to be opened by guards with a very heavy steel door. He has not allowed anything in his cell except his bed and the guards have been instructed not to talk to him. He has been described as gaunt, emaciated, and with straggly hair, and we can only imagine what the lack of any form of stimulation or human contact can further break a fractured mind. When he does get to leave his cage to exercise in another cage, guards avoid even making eye contact with him. He is still regarded as a dangerous criminal and is escorted everywhere with between four and six guards at all times. He has also a speech impediment now. This lack of communication and utter isolation has had severe effects on his fragile mind, and even his request for a budgie was denied. To this day, he believes that if he had killed his parents, he would be a free man. He has begged officials to just let him die, but to this day, he is trapped in a see-through box. When he dies, he would have beaten both Ian Brady and John Straffen as the prisoner who has spent the longest time in prison. The Plumstead Ripper While paging through the photographs of people who have called Broadmoor their home for a time, none is as disturbing to me than the one of Robert Knapper. If ever emptiness combined with madness could occupy a mind, the reflection is what you would experience when looking into his eyes. Even hardened gangster Ronnie Cray would warn female visitors not to make eye contact with the sexual sadist. Napper had a way of staring at a woman that evoked the terror a prey has when it notices a predator assessing its lunch. His crimes were so horrifying that the photographer collapsed on the scene. In order to recover from the trauma of what she had witnessed, she had to also take an extensive sick leave. He was born on the 26th of February, 1966, in Erith, England, to parents who were constantly arguing. His father, Brian, who was a driving instructor, 
and his wife Pauline would eventually divorce when Robert was 10, and he and his two young brothers and sister were placed in foster care. And it's reported that Napper would receive at least six years of psychiatric help during this time. It's also reported that Napper was sexually assaulted by a family friend on a camping holiday when he was 12. The offender was jailed, but Napper experienced a personality change. He would bully his siblings, become obsessively neat, and would spy on his sister while she undressed. Apart from being arrested for firing an air gun, he seemed to have no other criminal activity on his record. Napper's mother at one point made a phone call to the police regarding a rape in Plumstead she thought her son might have committed. Napper would get away with the crime because witnesses would state that the rapist was five foot seven, while Napper stood a sturdy six foot two. Only during his final conviction would there be enough evidence that Napper had indeed raped a woman on the Plumstead Common in front of her children. But at the time of the phone call, no evidence directly linking him to the crime could be found. His frenzied attacks would cause the death of a young mother later in front of her two-year-old child on Wimbledon Common. It appears that on the 15th of July, 1992, Napper decided to kill Rachel Nickel, stabbing her a staggering 49 times in front of her son, leaving the little boy to cling to his mother's lifeless and blood-drenched body for hours afterwards. A man by the name of Colin Stagg would be blamed wrongly for the murder. Colin would be in prison until Napper's confession cleared him. The crimes he would eventually be known for the most were the murders of Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine. Investigators knew from the onset that the crime was committed by someone who had watched and stalked their victims for some time before he murdered the beautiful blonde young woman and her bubbly little girl. The scene challenged every officer in its display of violence, as many had children around Jasmine's age. Her body was discovered on the first floor flat in November 1993, and from the windows inside the apartment, it's clear Napper had an uninterrupted view to the comings and goings of its occupants. He had been watching the unsuspecting young mother and her little girl for hours, and perhaps even days before the attack, since the bordering woodland would hide anyone who does not want to be seen. It's presumed that he scaled the ornate wall, which allowed him access to Samantha's balcony. Once inside, he wasted no time in attacking a surprised Samantha, stabbing the young woman 60 times before turning his attention to her daughter. Police would find Samantha displayed with stab wounds on her face, chest, and arms, and clearly Napper had made an attempt to separate her legs from her body. He then turned his attention to Jasmine, whom he strangled to death. The autopsy revealed that Napper had taken trophies in the form of abdominal skin, for instance. He also raped the corpse at some point of his mutilation. The horrific murder did, however, render a couple of clues that would lead investigators directly to the door of Robert Napper. Not only was a single bloody fingerprint found of the culprit, but the pathologist would later state that if Colin Stegg was not already in prison for the murder of Rachel Nickel, he would be convinced authorities were dealing with a serial offender. The crimes were also so similar to a couple of other rapes that had occurred in the Plumstead area, noting that Napper preferred to attack women with their very young children. The assumption was made that because the victims feared for their children's safety, Napper knew he would yield the least resistance. The murders of Samantha Bissett and her young daughter showed that, having more time and privacy by attacking them in their homes, he could escalate to his heart's desire. He had already been suspected of having committed even more rapes and sexual assaults and was most likely to be the green chain rapist, as the press had come to call him. Robert Knapper would be convicted of the murders in May 1995 in the Old Bailey and has been remanded at Broadmoor since then. 
Despite him denying any culpability with regards to the murder of Rachel Nichol, his DNA would be confirmed as that of the killer of the young mother. Robert Napper remains in Broadmoor to this day. The New Broadmoor In December 2019, everyone in Broadmoor occupied their new and modern facility, just a stone throw away from the old one. It had become clear that the old Victorian building that could hold only 200 of the country's most dangerous patients was ready for retirement. In constructing the new facility, authorities requested the input of staff and patients. While areas have been created to facilitate group therapy, workshops, and even religious worship, multidisciplinary staff have been appointed on every ward to promote the best rehabilitation. The new hospital is still shrouded in secrecy, but the state-of-the-art building is a far cry from her predecessor a couple of miles away. The open-plan architecture and modern surveillance cameras everywhere speaks volumes to how much security as well as the well-being of the patients are taken into consideration. Clearly, where the mentally ill were only housed a century ago, the focus now is on giving each person the best possible opportunity to live their best life. Staff are hopeful that faster and more successful rehabilitation would take place. Although, as we know, for some of the patients, this will be their home until the day they die. It's estimated that a breathtaking 200 million pounds was spent on the construction of the hospital. The ghost town that used to be so full of life now stands empty, and I have no doubt ghost hunters have scaled the walls to measure paranormal activity. There has been speculation about turning the hospital into a hotel, but the last reports I could find has speculated that the best solution might be to put the building up for auction. Epilogue This concludes our series on Broadmoor State Hospital. Mental health is a subject matter we take very seriously, and we urge you to seek help, no matter how strange or helpless your symptoms might make you feel. The proceeding was written by Misdemeanor. I have a developing story to tell our viewers about right now. I was actually on the golf course in Atlanta. Yeah! Oh my gosh, look at that thing. Right down the middle. Good job, Mike. When my best friend called me and told me, I knew it was over. You know, the things that I was trying to hide for so many years or thought I could get away with uh, was now coming to light. How could a football star making literally millions of dollars allegedly get involved in something like this? Allegations of hanging, shooting, body slamming, even electrocuting dogs to death as part of a multi-state underground dog fighting operation. Is a record-breaking NFL superstar, a former number one draft pick, losing a $120 million contract over dog fights? I was surprised because uh, I'd, I'd never seen a violent or angry or mean side of him. I was stunned because uh, Mike loved dogs. You know, we used to have uh, Saturdays where you could bring your kids or, you know, whatever. And Mike would bring dogs with him to practice. Would you at least like to proclaim your innocence? Like I said, we we'll won't talk about the situation right now. And when the investigation is over, then I'll be more than glad to answer any questions that you have for me. Michael Vick pled guilty to federal dogfighting charges. 66 dogs were removed from Vic's property, Bad News Kennels. The reports show some animals were found buried dead on that property. I personally think that he's a sociopath collective picture was a very bad one. There were tremendous concerns on my part about the severity of the crime, the effect on the animals, as well as the attitude of the individuals involved in this operation. 
Bad news. Kendall just started us wanting to breed pit bulls with the patches and the ones that, you know, look pretty and it was show dogs and we was going to sell them. And it just went from one aspect to another. It was kind of scary back there. Everything was all black. That was our cover up. We had a place where we trained the dogs. We had, you know, and 50 dogs on like chains. And it was the area where we had all the medicines and things that we used. Then you go upstairs and that's where they used to tangle. Where I grew up at, dog fighting, I didn't know that it was legal and I didn't know if it was illegal. I knew s several people, several friends that if they had a pit bull, you knew at some point in time they was going to fight it against somebody else who had a pit bull. That's just the way it was. The first time I saw a dog fight, I was like seven years old. And those bushes right there, see them big trees just leaning over like that? That's where everything used to happen. And that's where I seen my first dog fight. I know about the area in which Michael grew up. We work in those neighborhoods. It's a very sad situation when children grow up not thinking of dogs as friends, but as just something on a chain in the backyard. It's like a junked bicycle. Dogs are often just commodities. Michael Vick was a person who had an effect on the lives of many, many young people. He cast a very, very wide shadow, and that's why he had to be accountable for the effect he had on other people. Vic was sentenced to 23 months in prison and ordered to pay just under a million dollars in restitution for the care of the dogs. First, I want to apologize um, you know, for all the things that, that I've done and that I've allowed to happen. So I will redeem myself. I have to. Thank you. I kept saying, Mike, let's just run. Like, let's just escape. We can leave the country. We don't ever have to come back. Let's just go. He was like, no, I got to go do my time and get sober with. He was getting out the car, and I just was holding on. I didn't want him to go. I kept saying, please, just don't go. Just don't leave us. Like, what am I going to do by myself <laughs> with two kids? And he said, you'll be fine. You're going to be fine. The uncontainable number seven became inmate number 337-65183. It was heartbreaking for me. We came in together, and I'm thinking, you know, at some point in time, we're going to lead this franchise, this city, to a Super Bowl birth, possibly a championship. The Michael Vick experience, it's over with. Dog fighting is illegal in the United States. But like all other illegal activities, efforts invested in prevention have yielded mixed results. By the Humane Society's estimation, there are 40,000 people involved in dogfighting rings at any given time. The number could be higher, but the people who facilitate this activity are generally very effective at concealing it. It is practiced by people of all demographics and walks of life. From the residents of rural townships to highly educated white-collar professionals, dogs are exploited and abused for the purpose of gambling and entertainment. For some, it's a high-yielding cash business, but for others, it's primarily a hobby that brings in some supplemental income, with the only losses being those of dogs' lives. Unlike most forms of gambling, dog fighting operates at a very small level, and its participants at all levels are part of a tightly guarded circle. Some train their dogs with the best quality materials. The dogs are fed high quality food, given supplements, and in some cases, they are given steroids. The winners are bred for big money, with the puppies being very much in demand. The puppies are put through a six-week training period called the keep. They are put through rigorous and exhausting exercises, trained to be aggressive and given performance-enhancing substances. Though the dogs are usually chained up while they fight, 
There are also off-chain flights, which present the highest risk of a canine's grievous injury, often leading to death. The pit designated for fighting is typically 12 by 20 feet in size. There is usually a light-colored carpet on the floor so that when the dogs bleed, it will be visible to the spectators and trainers. There is a small fence around the pit situated to keep the dogs from escaping. The handlers hold the dogs until a referee yells, Fight! and they are released, whereupon the dogs charge at each other. The dogs will fight until one turns on its side and or disengages. This is the point at which the handlers take the dogs back to their corners. The dog that turns away will be released. If it runs at the other dog, the fight will resume. If it continues to refrain, the fight is over. Otherwise, the fight goes on until the handlers declare it over. It can be over in minutes, but some fights go on for hours. The winning dog will receive medical treatment if necessary. The losing dog will either be treated for its injuries or it might be killed. There is an online presence for the world of dog fighting where spectators and trainers compare notes on the brutality of recent fights. The following was written by Ed and Chris Farron in the book The Complete Game Dog about the medical needs of a dog that has been badly injured in a fight. She was so physically busted up that it was necessary to take the kennel crate apart to get her out of it. We spent the next hour or so desperately trying to save her, but nothing we did helped. The other dog had destroyed her face so badly that her sinuses were crushed. Her whole face was pulsing up and down as she breathed, and air was bubbling out of the holes on her muzzle and around her eyes. The last thing Jolene did before losing consciousness entirely was throw up an incredible amount of blood. We couldn't figure out how she could have swallowed so much. We carefully pried open her mouth and peered inside with a flashlight, and it was then we saw just how badly she was hurt. There was a big hole between her eyes, big enough on the outside to stick a dime into, and this hole went clear through her skull, emerging in the roof of her mouth, just in front of her throat. A thin trickle of blood was running down her throat. She must have been hemorrhaging throughout the fight. We sat there helplessly, watching our pride and joy take one last faltering breath, and then Jolene was gone. An academic study called The Social Milieu of Dog Men and Dog Fights by Rhonda Evans and Craig Forsyth described both the fights themselves and the social atmosphere of their surroundings. The handlers release their dogs and Snow and Black lunge at one another. Snow rears up and overpowers Black, but Black manages to come back with a quick locking of the jaws on Snow's neck. The crowd is cheering wildly and yelling out bets. Once a dog gets a lock on the other, they will hold on with all their might. The dogs flail back and forth, and all the while Black maintains her hold. Snow goes straight for the throat and grabs hold with her razor-sharp teeth. Almost immediately, blood flows from Black's throat. Despite a serious injury to the throat, Black manages to continue fighting back. They are relentless, each battling the other and neither willing to accept defeat. This fighting continues for an hour. Finally, the referee gives the third and final pit call. It is Black's turn to scratch, and she is severely wounded. Black manages to crawl across the pit to meet her opponent. Snow attacks Black, and she is too weak to fight back. LG, Black's owner, realizes that this is it for Black and calls the fight. Snow is declared the winner. The following is from a fact sheet issued by the Humane Society of the United States. What can I do to help stop dog fights? Learn how to spot the signs of dog fighting. If you suspect an operation in your area, alert your local law enforcement agency and urge officials to contact the HSUS for practical tools, advice, and assistance. If you live in one of the states where being a spectator at a dog fight is still a misdemeanor, 
please write to your state legislators and urge them to make it a felony. Animal suffering and dog fighting. The injuries inflicted and sustained by dog fights are severe and often fatal. The dogs used in the majority of these fights have been specifically bred and trained for fighting, an upbringing that relies on abuse and mistreatment from puppyhood. Typical injuries of fighting dogs include severe bruising, deep puncture wounds, and broken bones. Dogs used in these events often die of blood loss, shock, dehydration, exhaustion, or infection hours or even days after the fight. Otherwise healthy dogs who are born quote-unquote cold or won't fight are often used to sick other dogs on as training. In describing the details of one particular dog fight, a convicted dog fighter wrote, Miss Rufus spent most of the rest of the fight on her back and Bandit broke her other front leg high up in the shoulder, as well as one of her back legs, in the knee joint. The only leg she didn't break, she chewed all to hell. She had literally scalped Miss Rufus, tearing a big chunk of skin off the top of her head, alongside one ear. Breeding Criminal Activity Over the years, law enforcement raids have unearthed many disturbing facets of this illegal practice, Young children are often present at these events, which promotes insensitivity to animal suffering, enthusiasm for violence, and disrespect for the law. Illegal gambling is commonplace at dog fights, with wagers of thousands of dollars at stake. This profitability makes dog fighting commonplace in organized crime settings, as well as the streets. The sale and use of illegal drugs is common at dog fights as well, and firearms and other weapons have been found at these events due to the large amounts of cash present. Fighting dogs have also been connected to other kinds of violence, even homicide. Dog fighting is a felony offense in all 50 states, and it is a felony offense under federal law as well. It is also a felony to knowingly bring a minor to an animal fight. There are several compelling reasons for this. Because fighting dogs yield such large profits, the penalties associated with misdemeanor convictions are much too weak to act as a sufficient deterrent and are simply seen as the cost of doing business. Fighting dogs should be punished by more than a slap on the wrist. It's not a spur-of-the-moment act. It is an organized and cruel practice. Those involved in these operations go to extensive lengths to avoid detection by law enforcement, so investigations can be difficult, dangerous, and expensive. Making dog fighting a felony means law enforcement officials are able to put in the effort needed to properly investigate. The Humane Society of the United States supports felony charges for spectators of dog fights. Spectators provide much of the profit associated with fighting dogs and, with it, the motivation to continue the cruel practice. Because dog fights aren't widely publicized, spectators do not merely happen upon a fight. They seek it out. They are willing participants who support criminal activity through their paid admission and attendance. Thankfully, many states have realized that felony charges for spectators can help crack down on animal fighting, but more legislation is still needed. April 25, 2007 to August 28, 2007 There was once a landscape of bondage and hardship a place where the innocent are persecuted without having committed any crimes, a place where the victims have no voice to articulate the harrowing details of the circumstances from which they suffer. They are not persecuted for their race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, or creed. Those considerations are not even relevant. They are not even human. They are dogs, and their handlers are humans though the way they treat these dogs is inhuman. It is hard to distinguish which is worse, the cruelty or the lack of empathy and remorse that makes it easy for them to torture innocent creatures. 
Picture it. A dog is sitting in a field with a collar around her neck. It's three inches thick and attached to a heavy link chain. The kind of chain you might attach to heavy inanimate objects to drag them down the street. Speaking of which, the chain is attached to the axle of a car, which is buried in the ground. It is a hot summer day in Virginia, and there is no relief for this dog. Human beings purchase fans and air conditioners so that they won't have to suffer through such conditions. This dog is not nearly as fortunate. If a human child were left outdoors in those circumstances, a posse of police officers and social workers would swoop down on the offending parents, and we would hear about it from the media. Such a thing has not happened around this dog. Not yet, anyway. The dog paces because it is on a very short leash with no kind of stimulation. She is still an animal and does not react to such restrictions well. There is no logic in chaining her up like that, and she knows it as we do. Her only social interactions, besides those with her abusive handlers, is with passing wildlife. Raccoons, skunks, snakes, and other animals pass by, and she barks at them. Barking at their trespassing on her territory is the only means by which she can maintain what remains of her dignity. She gets bitten by mosquitoes and struggles to bite at the itches that are not as easy to reach. It's a lonely way to live, but she is not alone. There are other dogs like her. She is surrounded by them. They are separated so that they cannot interact in any way. They will interact eventually, just not for the purpose of friendship. That is not what her handlers want. They want hostility. They want these dogs to view one another with hatred, homicidal ideation. Their positioning is not coincidental. Their handlers want to frustrate them in their inability to gain access to one another. If they were to bond with the others, if they were to horse around playfully, they would hold one another in high regard, and that will not serve their owners well in the context of dog fighting. Keeping them separated like this has the intended effect of building up a bloodthirsty wrath within most of them. It also depresses them. Dogs are social animals, having evolved in packs, and being isolated from the rest of the pack usually results in separation anxiety. These dogs do not live as dogs are supposed to live. It is a violation of their very nature. Their owners and handlers do not concern themselves with these ethical concerns. They are motivated solely by financial gain. Most baffling is that the ringleader, Michael Vick, a successful and decorated NFL football player, was wealthy and did not need to turn to something like dogfighting to invest his money and make it grow. There must be something else behind it, something far more sinister. It is something he only became involved in after his successes in football, but for these dogs, it is all they know. They were born into it. There are entire families trapped in this situation. They were bred for it. Mothers, fathers, puppies. They are destined to be torn apart by dogs that are socialized to kill. They are all pit bulls, and in this circumstance, the stereotype of the aggressive and violent pit bull holds up. Tubs of water are provided so that they don't become dehydrated. The water isn't always clean. A bowl of food is set out once a day. Sometimes the feedings are more infrequent. On occasion, two or as many as three days go by before a man on an ATV comes by to feed the meal tickets. By that time, the dogs are so desperately hungry, they run to the fullest lengths of their chains in anticipation of feeding. If they get too close to the man distributing the food, they will cower with their tails tucked beneath their legs. They have learned the hard way what will result of them displeasing their handlers. They only eat once the man has left, and even then, they only inch toward the bowls. There is another grouping of dogs in an adjacent clearing, which is fenced off, that houses 15 or more dogs. At the edge of the forest is a kennel and freestanding sheds. The buildings are painted black, including the windows. 
There is one building two stories tall and has been dubbed by the men who administer to the facility and the dogs as the Black Hole. There are dog houses that provide relief from the sun, but not from the heat. They are made of plywood, and the dogs will claw and chew at it as their only way to pass the time. Sometimes men will take a few of the dogs out and bring them back later. When they return, the dogs are exhausted and short of breath. It is the result of their daily exercises. They are forced to run the equivalent of long distances. Sometimes the dogs finish the day with scars and a limping gait. Sometimes they are the same physically, but inwardly they have been tra- Sometimes they are the same physically, but inwardly they have been transformed and never in a good way. Some of them never return. All of the proceeding transpires in the back of a property bearing a mansion that features air conditioning, a jacuzzi, a full basketball court, an above-ground pool, and other creature comforts. The occupants enjoy luxuries that the dogs out back cannot even conceive of. A man brings one of the dogs into the black hole. She has not eaten for three days. The man grabs a small rope that hangs from the ceiling in a corner. He pulls on it, and at the sound of a squeak, a staircase is lowered from above. He carries the dog up to the second floor. Once upstairs, the man flicks a switch. Bright lights illuminate a small room furnished with nothing but a small carpet in the center. The carpet is an off-white color with dark blotches. The blotches were made by bleeding dogs. The dog picks up on many odors that the man cannot smell. She knows that many dogs and humans have occupied the space. She can smell residual blood, sweat, and urine. Dogs emit a distinctive musk when they are afraid, which is undetectable to the human nose, but for dogs it is unmistakable. This likely also hung in the air because she became anxious and began to fret. She can hear a commotion downstairs, and soon another man emerges into the second level. He is carrying a dog of a similar profile. The dogs do not recognize each other. They are both females and about the same size. The dogs are positioned head to head. The second man to arrive says to his dog, Let's go, let's go, let's go. Two other men arrive on the second level, and they begin to shout in like fashion. The second man puts his hand on his dog's face and shoves her backwards. She advanced toward him, and he did it again. He grabs her muzzle and shakes her head from side to side. His dog has been frustrated and frightened for days, and, along with her lack of feeding, she is now boiling over with rage. The other dog feels the same animus, and they both begin to growl at each other as the men egg them on. Once the men feel the dogs are sufficiently enraged, they let go of their leashes, and the dogs have at each other. The dogs circle each other warily at first. One dog rears up and puts her paws on her opponent. The other dog recoils for a moment, but then lurches in retaliation. They go back to circling each other, sniffing, decoding the olfactory language, and deciphering what the other is trying to articulate. The second man pulls his dog back and yells at her. Her tail falls between her legs. Dissatisfied with the progress of the confrontation, the men bring the dogs back together so closely they are nose to nose. They hold them in that position. The dogs bark and struggle, but their handlers will not budge. Before long, the frustration felt by both dogs is more than they are willing to repress, and they begin to bite each other. They rise to their hind legs and begin to bite off hunks of flesh. The first dog bites the other's ear and sinks her teeth onto the back of her neck. The other dog snaps at her foreleg. They fall to the floor together, tangled in combat, biting each other as they roll around on the carpet, grappling for dominance. Despite all this, the men are silent. They are disappointed. They hoped for a more vexatious show of deadly aggression. They wanted to see more skill on display. The men make their disappointment known. 
The second dog was carried halfway down the stairs and then tossed to the floor. The other was thrown from the top floor and left to tumble all the way down the stairs. She squeals when she lands. When she stands, she is only able to walk on three legs, with the fourth reacting with blinding pain whenever she puts her weight on it. One of the men sprays them with a hose and puts them in an otherwise empty kennel. There is no food and water in the kennel. Eventually, other dogs are brought to the kennel. Some have flesh wounds in their snouts or forelegs. They whimper as they lick at their wounds. This is not an uncommon outcome of the keep. An estimated 80% of dogs trained for fighting do not rise to the occasion. Such dogs are usually killed as their owners see no utility in them once they are incapable of making them money. The first dog brought to the black hole is taken to a tree. A man ties an old nylon leash around her neck. He carries her over to two trees that are adjacent to each other. Another man ties the leash to a two-by-four that has been nailed between the trees. The first man ties the leash to the board. He elevates the dog and then releases her. After a moment of jerking motions, the dog's vital signs peter out. She has been hung. She is dead. The other man takes another dog and pushes his head into a bucket of water. The dog struggles for emancipation, but his handler is too strong for him, and he drowns. All told, it was a productive day for those whose charge it was to execute the dogs that were not vicious enough for their liking. Four were drowned and four were hung. The hangings were worse because some didn't die a quick death, with blood trickling out of their mouths. In some cases, they still weren't dead after they were cut down, so they were drowned in the bucket. Michael Vick was introduced to dogfighting when he was seven years old. It was a common activity in the inner-city neighborhood in which he dwelled. It was one of many illegal activities engaged in out in the open in that area, along with drug trafficking. He got involved with dogfighting when he was 13, but became sidetracked by sports and did not participate until he was finished with his run at university. An old friend named Tony Taylor was in a barber shop when Vic and his friend Quanis Phillips stopped by. Vic knew Taylor was a denizen of the dogfighting underground. Vic asked him about the possibility of getting involved in dogfighting again. Taylor told him about an associate who owned a property where he ran a dogfighting ring. He had taught Taylor everything he knew about the sport. The man's name was Benny Butts. By this point, Vic was a millionaire, and the men got serious about creating their own dogfighting ring. It would be a business venture and a boon to an image as a thug and gangsta. What you need most to operate a dogfighting ring is connections, and Taylor had connections galore. They saw themselves in the dogs. The dogs would persevere against daunting circumstances to prevail and succeed. The men formed a triad, with Vic financing the operation, Phillips overseeing it in a managerial capacity, and Taylor would play more of a hands-on role, caring for the dogs firsthand. At a later date, Taylor's cousin, Purnell Peace, got involved. He provided a facade of legitimacy by obtaining a kennel license. The plan on that front was to legally breed dogs and advertise it as a typical kennel that provided shelter and care for dogs. They built the training and shelter facility for the dogs in Surrey County, Virginia, which happened to also be where the world headquarters for the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals was situated. They called their business Bad News Kennels. The moniker couldn't have possibly been more apropos. All the staff operating and facilitating the kennel had criminal records. Most charges were drug-related. When a SWAT team acted on intel that a dogfighting ring was underway on the property, they raided the house. Those who occupied the quarters full-time lived in squalor. Not Vic. He still lived in his plush mansion miles away. The place was filthy. There was marijuana and related paraphernalia lying around. 
unregistered firearms set out in the open. 35 dogs were counted at the kennel initially. 20 of them were pit bulls, but there were also hunting beagles, rottweilers, and a handful of presa canarios. The dogs were skinny and some bore scars. Some of the officers made contact with the dogs, patting them. At first the dogs demurred, but then they would cower as if anticipating abuse. All told, 51 dogs were seized. More evidence included a three-ring binder filled with paperwork related to dog fighting and breeding. The officers had to house the dogs in multiple shelters since there were so many. Some of the dogs had open wounds and they were starving. They had a look at the exercise facility. There were weight pull harnesses, a treadmill, three slat mills, and a jenny wheel. The same equipment had been confiscated from a dogfighting veteran named Benny Butts seven years prior. In another shed was a quasi-veterinarian's lab. It had been cleaned and disinfected. Syringes and other medical supplies had been placed along a counter. Brake sticks were set up to forcefully open dogs' mouths and keep them open. There was a rape stand used to hold a female in place during breeding. Bags of protein powder and other performance-enhancing substances were on display. An officer spotted something white and shiny on a windowsill. When he took a closer look, he saw that it was a dog's tooth. The corpses of dogs would later be found to have been buried throughout the property. April 27, 2007. Michael Vick appeared at an event related to the NFL draft. When asked to comment on the raid, he said, I'm never at the house. I left the house with my family, members, and my cousin. They just haven't been doing the right thing. It's unfortunate I have to take the heat. If I'm not there, I don't know what's going on. It's a call for me to really tighten down on who I'm trying to take care of. When it all boils down, people will try to take advantage of you and leave you out to dry. Lesson learned for me. An inmate in prison came forward to report that he had been involved in a dogfighting ring owned and operated by Michael Vick and his cohorts. Among the charges were crossing state lines to buy dogs for the purpose of dog fighting, participation in dog fights, and illegal gambling. The problem was, the feds didn't consider it to be a priority. Prosecutors were more likely to achieve justice at the state level. Since serving his prison sentence, Michael Vick has not been involved in dog fighting. This is an interview with Michael Vick about his experience getting involved in the dog fighting ring. Let's talk about that period that you went through in your life. You get the $130 million contract at the time you were the highest paid player in the NFL. Yeah. Mike, I lived in Atlanta when you were in Atlanta and you might have been, you, you were as popular, if not more popular than Chipper Jones. And everybody, if you from Georgia, they know what you're Chipper. <laughs> Shout out to Chip. And, and so I'm thinking to myself, Mike, you could have had a car dealership. You could have had about five or six McDonald's. You could have had franchise after franchise. You get that money. What made you to think to say, you know what? I want to do something that I don't know if you thought that what you did was that harmful, but I'm saying a dog fighting ring. That's what yeah. you, you get. You get a you probably got 25 million yeah, aside. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I had 13 million in the bank. <laughs> when I, you know, when I was what, 25, 26 years old and, knew, and didn't know what to do with it. Right. That's where I come from. Right. You know, by the time I end up taking you care of my car wash, you ain't think about a barbershop. I was young. I went to Arthur Blank and I told him, I said, Mr. Blank. He used to always come to me like, you're spending all your money, you're spending all your money. This is real story, it's true talk. And I'm like, nah, nah, I got $15 million in the bank. I don't know what to do with this money. Right. I got everything I want. Every car, every house, whatever. I don't know what to do. And there's more coming. You got mom, got so, mom situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, I got to protect this now. So I'm like, yeah, introduce me to some people. Right. And help me, you know, grow this. Right. And, and so we had a sit down and, and uh, you know, it, it kind of went, it kind of went crazy. Um, and that's, you know, uh, to be determined, but, uh, yeah, man, I, I was, I was making those, taking those steps to invest my money properly and money was put into Union City, Atlanta, 
Um, we was gonna build a city, strip malls and mm -hmm. restaurants, and we had a grant. We was so I was getting there. Right. I was turning the car. I was right. I was doing what I was supposed right. to do. And then uh, you know, I ended up, you know, why as I started to turn the corner, as I started to see life different, you know, I got a, you know, I got a young, you know, daughter at the time. I got a son that's like four. And, you know, as I'm starting to make change, you know, it was just a little too late. Right. It was a little too late. And then I ended up going through that and they, they took everything from me. Right. They took everything, Shane. Like I had, I, I had 8 million, like, invested in the city. I, they took it all. I'm like, Yo, how you do that? So in other words, they thought that the money that even though you're a professional athlete, they think that the money that you got, you got it through ill-gotten means, that you got that through the ring. No, I earned that. No, I, I earned that. That was that came from my play. Right. I, I mean, I saved every I might have spent, I might have spent close to maybe liquid, maybe like $2 million. Right. But it was just How do you get, so much bread. Who, whose idea was it? Say, like, hey, Mike, I got this great idea. Because normally homeboys come up, they got a car wash, or they go in and get you the club. Yeah. Hey, homeboy, we ought to open this club yeah. with your money. You know, you take all the real, you, <laughs> with know, your money. you know, everybody got all these ideas, Mike, with your money now. Ain't yeah, nobody yeah. else bringing anything to yeah. the table yeah. but an idea. Right. No money, right. idea. So, so, so when they came to you, say, hey, Mike, I think we can do this. Because, I mean, with any business, I mean, it has to have a yeah. business model, business plan. You got to get dogs. You want to get the best, best dogs from all around the world. You might have to import dogs from Argentina, wherever they do that at. You might have to import the dogs. Right. Okay, now we got to build out. We got to build kennels to house the dogs. I will say this. That had nothing to do with any of my friends. That was you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was. Kind of, I, I, grew up in, I grew up under that. So, like, I grew up seeing that, grew up watching it. So it, it just never, like, I still had the hood in me. You're right. I still had the hood in me. And it's like, yo, we're going to stay true to our roots. We're Mike, you worked your this. ass off. You had a lot of homeboys yeah. that didn't work as hard as you and stayed there. You worked your ass off to leave there in order to just to go back. Yeah, but nobody never. To visit. Nobody never went to prison, though. You didn't think, I, I, yeah. So I'm like, uh, I never, I'm look, like, I know about. You know, I'm from a small town in the south. Yeah, and I, I know about dogs. So you can relate, yeah. But I, I, I had never heard of anybody going to jail either. Me neither. So I, you know, so that's why I was like, so I, I, so I didn't go, I didn't go to prison for that. Right. You know, I went to prison for interstate commerce. Right. Which was kind of, you know, confusing. Like, damn, okay, you know, so laws and rules had to be changed right. in order to make it. So that, you know, I, but look, I, that's water under the bridge. Right. Got a documentary coming out to talk about oh, it all. Okay. And just kind of clearing the air on right. uh, the big misconceptions and the way I'm perceived. It, it's like, you, you know, have, I, I don't take anything away. I don't blame anybody but myself for right. everything. But it's some things that I, you know, I feel, I do feel like I got to take advantage of in a lot of situations. I look at it like this. You didn't have any homeboys. I mean, like when you first started coming on the show. My homeboys are shocked though. They... They wanted nothing but the best for me. Right. But they knew I was I was I was a hard head. Hard head. When I when I not not because I had a lot of money and I could I could make decisions, but they knew like yo if if, uh, if we deter Mike from doing this, he ain't gonna do nothing but continue to do. You know what I'm he saying? He gonna do it so, with somebody else. He gonna cut him. <laughs> yeah. So they they cut felt like they was, they felt like they were stuck between the rock right. and the hard spot with me, and I res I respect them for that and just the. I heard the stories of them, you know, wanting me to get away from me, but they, they you know, they didn't know what to do, man. Right. You know, they, I mean, I, maybe they felt like, man, Mike, Mike, you might cut me off right. if I, you know, if I go too hard on them. And, and, and it's, it's, it's really, me it's messed up because that's how we was on the right track. Right. Everybody. And then when I say they had big plans, big dreams, and, you know, we started a sports agency. We was doing a lot of stuff, man. They had sharp ideas and by the decision that I made. Right decision that I made screwed everything up. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.